Information technology has changed nearly everything about modern living, the way we communicate, earn a living, and even how we date. Today's guest examines the implications of cybersecurity on war and statecraft. He's Jason Healy this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salvia Regina University in beautiful Newport, Rhode Island. Alongside me, as always, is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week, we sit down with scholars and storytellers to try to understand the meaning and impact of the narrative shaping American public life. This week, we're joined by Jason Healy, a senior research scholar at Columbia University's School for International and Public Affairs, where he specializes in cyber conflict competition and cooperation. Jay, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So cybersecurity is a phrase that we hear a lot about. It's in the news uh, with increasing frequency. Uh, a lot of businesses around the country are paying more and more attention, at least they ought to be. Uh, if, if someone's not familiar with the term, what are we talking about when we're talking about cyber and cybersecurity? Well, it's so interesting because it does tie into to this program. We've got different stories that we tell about it. And the story that you tell and the way that you think about it and define it helps determine the path of what you think we ought to do. So in some terms, we're saying it's like computer security. It's how um, your reviewers or your companies can, can try and keep, um, keep your computers and keep everyone safe from the many predators that are out there that would want to hack you. Uh, it also gets into warfare and espionage and what nations do against one another, where you and I don't really have much to do about that. It's, it's what's the spies and the soldiers and the, and the cyber warriors that are out doing. In general, we're talking about the internet and the many devices that are connected to it. That used to be our desktop computers, for those of us that grew up with the desktop computers. Now, of course, it's the phones, it's the internet-enabled refrigerators and uh, smart cars and everything else that we're starting to internetwork. And with the proliferation of devices, there's a proliferation of vulnerability? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so if you're talking to someone that's really in the business, I'll talk about attack surface, right? The, what's the amount of devices and vulnerabilities that the bad guys can attack? And the more devices that we're adding, these things are incredibly complex with millions of lines of, of software code in it. And each one of those lines has a chance that it has a bug and a vulnerability. And if, and if there's a bug or a vulnerability, there's a chance that it's going to give a, a hacker an advantage, of, a place that he can get his fingers into and try and get access to that. And so the more devices we're, we're adding, the more and more complex this gets and the easier time the hackers have. So you. Obviously, cyber is a new form or, or place for warfare mm -hmm. compared to the old-fashioned land, sea, air, and, and whatever. But you have said that it's even something more substantial, that the technology here is more transformative than anything pretty much since Gutenberg. That's a pretty bold statement. I think it's probably a correct statement. Explain that. Unpack that for our audience. So remember what I, where I led off with is that we have these different narratives, these different stories in this place, because none of us have really direct experience with cyberspace, right? We're, we're like we do with the air or land or sea, right? We, we can just go down um, uh, to Newport and we can dip our toe in the ocean and we can feel, we can feel what, uh, what the sea is like. But we don't have that experience with cyberspace, with the internet. We have to experience it through devices and the rest. So we, have to, we end up with a lot of these analogies. And the analogies that uh, Washington, D.C. is on is, well, cyberspace, it's a war fighting domain. It's a place where, just like we've got the Navy to fight in, in the seas, and we've got the Army to fight on land, with the Air Force for air and space, um, that we have the cyberspace force because it's a place where America needs to contend with its adversaries. Uh, and, that's, and that's well and true, and there's nothing wrong, essentially, with that narrative. But it also misses the point. Um, a lot of times when someone's talking cyber, and this gets to your question, Jim, we're talking about all the bad stuff that can happen, 
oh, woe is us, all these hackers are out there. And it means we're missing the, the upside when we're talking about things digital. Yeah. Right? When we talk about digital, we're saying, oh, isn't it wonderful we have these digital devices and what it does to the economy and innovation. And, and so I try and remind my colleagues in Washington, D.C., is this isn't just a domain for war fighting. It's one of the most transformative technologies that's come from the minds of humans in the last 500 years. Right? Maybe it's already surpassed Gutenberg and movable type. Maybe, it, it, maybe not. You know, electric. You know, um, electricity is a pretty cool invention. You know, and maybe cyberspace isn't cool as, as cool as, as electricity just yet. But certainly in our lives, in the lives of our kids, in the lives of our grandkids, it certainly might bypass movable type. It, it might literally be the most transformative thing since fire or the wheel. So do you, so do you think the ordinary person, the average citizen like me and, and Jim, really comprehends that, or or is this almost incomprehensible? as this is happening. I mean, you know, it's the old thing about when you write about presidents, you wait 50 mm -hmm. years. I he heard David McCullough on the radio saying you need to wait 50 years for the dust to settle and figure it out, <laughs> which I think is very true. But is that true also for, for this technology? I mean, it, it moves so fast. When you're in the middle of, sub of the sublime, it's really tough to realize, right? I had to move away to college um, to come back to Rhode Island and say, oh my God, how was I not bowled over by these leaves changing every fall, right? I mean, you know it's beautiful, yeah. but you have to oh, kind of unplug from it and come back to and just realize what's transformative. So I sent the summer out at Stanford, and I think there they get it, right? They're saying that's what, that's what Palo Alto and, and the Bay Area is about, is the transformative power, the lives we're changing. If there's a problem in society, we'll invent something and fix it. And that, again, that has its own narrative power. That's different from Washington, D.C., where the narrative is, well, there's advantages and disadvantages and challenges, and, and, and we, if there are problems, we'll try and come up with a policy about it. Well, so if I could put, maybe, I don't want to push this too far, but the, 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 it seems like it's a contrast between uh, a, a narrative of opportunity versus a narrative of threat. Uh, is one more valid than the other, or is it just sort of which narrative serves the you know, the, the particular agenda of the day. Well, they're, well they're, they're all useful, but especially when we as Americans and, and around the world are feeling so at risk yeah. that you tend to go to the things that are gonna make you feel safer. You tend to do these short-term decisions um, and not sit back and say, all right, well, how is this affecting us overall? Uh, I made a, I always thought it as, you know, if you, for example, how we got into Vietnam. You know, even if every decision that we got, got us into Vietnam made sense, at some point, you just had to sit back and say, how did we get here? Right. Mm. Um, I had a former director of NSA uh, and Cyber Command, uh, General Hayden, um, also was in the Air Force like me, and he said, well, Jay, I like to see it as a, as a French pointillist painter, right? Each dot that you put on the canvas, even if each dot is perfectly placed, at some point, you have to sit back and look at the painting that comes out of it. Interesting. And it, that, I think, we're not doing well enough yet. Is anybody doing that at all? I mean, I, is anybody doing that well? Uh, I stepping back and saying, what does this mean in terms not only of technology and society today, but in terms of the human experience and the stories that people tell? I, I think it's very difficult because a lot of times, uh, there are some, but a lot of us that do it, we have our own agendas, we have our own perspectives. We're layering different views onto this as we go through it. For example, a lot, that, a lot of people that do it are you know, pushing strong civil liberties and privacy. Um, I know that that's not going to work in Washington, D.C., so I tend to say this is, let's look at it in the best outcomes in the longer term for national security, right? If I'm debating with a general, he's going to shut me off if I say privacy. But if I have to say this, will, this might lead to worse national security outcomes in 10 years, and now I'm using the language and the narrative that I can connect with him with. Now he can disagree with me or agree with me, but he's not going to shut me out. So when you look, so if we if we take that, uh, um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pick one narrative or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we think about the top issues in cybersecurity, it's sort of a, a value neutral uh, term, right? If we think about issues in cybersecurity, what are the top issues uh, on your list? So much right now. When so I did the, this history book called A Fierce Domain on, and it was kind of a military history of cyberspace. And it was relatively easy for me to say five years ago that there hadn't been any significant any cyber attack that was significant in real national security terms. Like as far as we can tell, no one's no one's died from a cyber attack yet. Um, the attacks that had happened were 
important, but not really as important as you know, North Korea launching missiles over Japan or whatever the horrible headline of the day is. And I don't think I can say that anymore because we've just been seeing so many significant attacks. The attacks hadn't been serious because all attacks do were take down things of, made of silicon, um, things made of ones and zeros. Yeah. And now that we're doing things like the Internet of Things, right, we're connecting factories and power plants and cars and dams to the Internet. Now the attacks won't just take down things made of ones and zeros, but things made of concrete and steel. And now that's, that's a, the main concern for a lot of us, is now you might start seeing a hack not just taking your data, but, but taking someone's lives. Have we seen any examples of that happening yet or attempts to make that happen yet? And, and let's look at the domestic, mm -hmm. the American scene. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence that there have been at least attempts to do that? Not directed that I know of. Um, there had been um, there had been talk of hey people have pacemakers and that you know Bluetooth enabled pacemakers right and things like that and and, and it doesn't take us you know a, th a writer of thrillers to think about what you might do with that right, right. yeah and so on the directed no uh, the security researchers have been out and showing that look you can hack cars you can hack cars from afar right, right? I mean you've got OnStar on your car that's a, a radio that someone can connect in with you know that's connected to the internet um, but only only demonstration one security researcher hacker he had a um, he was diabetic so he had his pump and he said he took his mindset that he takes as a hacker and say huh can I hack this pump and it was trivial so the attacks we have seen uh, Russian hackers had taken down the Ukrainian power grid twice the um, Russian-aligned hackers took down a French TV studio, um, a German foundry, uh, you know, steel, uh, steel smelting plant, um, had been taken offline, and boy, that's <laughs> that, that, that's dangerous, right? Yeah. So th there's probably no question in your mind that there are bad actors, whether they're associated with a nation or individuals, who would like to do that, have that ability, and that would yes. be a goal for them. Yes, uh, and the United States uh, and Israel took down Iranian uranium enrichment plant um, at Natanz um, five years ago to, to blow up their centrifuges. So the nation states are certainly starting to look at this as a capability they can use, but states haven't used it so far because if they know they do, it's war, <laughs> right? That if, if you do this kind of thing, then you're crossing a line. So it's sort of a, it's sort of a Cold War deterrent, mutual assured destruction, yeah, yeah, that, as it were. States haven't wanted to go above that line. But well, some states would like to, I'm guessing. They might. I mean, South Korea, I, I'm sorry, North Korea, certainly right now, you can imagine being yeah. in a position. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what Russia did in 2016. So mm -hmm. there is a narrative that is put forward uh, principally by the Trump administration that we don't know who stole the mm -hmm. DNC emails, that uh, it could have been Russia, it could have been China, it could have been, I think that the, the phrase the president used in one of the debates was some 400 guy living in his mother's basement in New Jersey. Yep. Do we know who stole the, the DNC emails? There is a, an exceptionally high level of confidence. Uh, in general, we, we call it attribution, trying to figure out who was behind the keyboard yeah. and then trying to figure out who was behind them. And this has been very, very difficult for a long, long time. Because the internet, anyone can join the internet, right? I mean, you don't have to join in and say, hi, this is Jim, verify me, right? You, you can just right. join. And but we have gotten very, very good at this in the last, I would say, 10 years. So there are a number of companies that are exceptionally good at this. The United States government has gotten very good at this. And, and both agreed in this, that there were through multiple lines of evidence that this was, this was without a doubt the Russians. And so, um, yeah, so for the intelligence community and others to come out and say that publicly, that takes a very, very high level of confidence. But, but they're, they're nonetheless, and you're absolutely right about this, but there nonetheless is a, a contrarian story told which says that there's no proof that the Russians were involved here, yeah. that we don't know who was involved here, that the government may claim it, but who believes the government? How do you respond to that? Because that story is out there as well right. on the internet and in conversations. Right, and a lot of my level of confidence comes not just from knowing what we've got in place, it's not just from knowing government and knowing, boy, they would only have come out with this from the intel community to say high level of confidence. I know what they mean by that. I know the bureaucratic inertia to not say things like that. 
uh, my personal friends, both in the intelligence community and at, at these companies, sit down and say, we've all looked at the data, we've all shared it, um, uh, we all know what this was. But you're right, not everyone has those level, you know, that has that, ha has that view that I have. So I think the government has, is long overdue in declassifying some of this, coming out, talking oh, about this better. Yeah. Some of the companies, I think, can maybe do a little bit better, better job about, um, about spelling it out in, in ways that the normal viewer of a PBS show would be able to watch. Well, that know? makes sense. Why haven't they done that? I don't know. I mean, the, uh, I don't know. I will, I will ask them. I know the government has tried, but I think they did a pretty bad, you know, especially the first report they did at it. It was, called, it was a report called Grizzly Step, and it was just not, it was not well done. But I think it, it will be a little more difficult for, for the U.S. government to try and to tell this story now because, of yeah. course, they, they're split on, on the view of it. Let me uh, take a quick moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. If you want to catch up with me on Twitter, I'm at J.M. Lutis. My co-host and friend each week is an award-winning journalist, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. He's tweeting at G. Wayne Miller. Story in the Public Square is produced by a really amazing team of professionals at Rhode Island PBS in Providence, Rhode Island. An audio version of the program can be heard three times each weekend on Sirius XM Satellite Radio's popular Politics of the United States, the POTUS Channel 124. And our guest this week is Jason Healy, Senior Research Scholar at Columbia University's School for International and Public Affairs. He's on Twitter too at Jason underscore Healy. That's H-E-A-L-E-Y. So Jay, um, You've spent some time thinking about the interface of cyber and conflict. I look at what happened mm -hmm. in 2016, and I see a, a concentrated Russian effort to exfiltrate, to steal information, mm -hmm. but then to turn it around and use that information as part of an influence campaign. Is that part of the future of conflict? Uh, unfortunately, it looks like, and it, was, and it was not one that the United States is really well positioned uh, to cover. The Department of Defense in the 1990s um, and the U.S. government in general had been looking at this information operations and propaganda and counter propaganda and how can we handle this. We used it to our advantage in the operations in Serbia mm -hmm. uh, against Slobodan Milosevic. Or like, how can we influence him and his cronies to get them out of Kosovo? And in general, the U.S. government has backed away from that. One, we've been entranced by this shiny new thing of cyber, and well, we can, why worry about information? We can just hack guys directly, right. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> and, and that's kind of taken over what the US government has been doing for the last, oh, say, 15 years. But also, it is hard for a democracy to, to get in and counter message and, and say, well, these news sources are valid and these news sources are fake, right? It, we as Americans, we just, we get a little itchy when we have the government trying to come in and do such things. And, so this has been something that, um, you know, going back to early Soviet Union, right? I mean, to even to the point of Lenin and Stalin, that they would, that they would like to do, to keep other nations, um, flood them with bad information, try and keep them um, on the back foot and off balance. So does the current uh, turbulent atmosphere in Washington and certainly a degree of, uh, of gridlock complicate or even stifle the government's efforts, should they choose to do this, to get this story out, to be more candid and forthright and explain, folks, here's what's going on and there's not much uncertainty and you need to know this. Yeah, I, I think so without a doubt. You're seeing, uh, for example, the Senate is putting out um, intelligence bills that are saying no money can be spent on uh, to team up with Russia on a hacking unit, <laughs> a joint U.S.-Russia hacking unit. After the president said he was going to create something After like that. the president said he was going to create something like that. Um, and coming out and saying we need a strategy, you know, the executive branch has to develop a strategy to defeat Russian election um, machinations, and you need to come out with reports on what you're doing about it, and you need it. I mean, so here you've got the Senate that's having to tell the executive branch what they want done and what they refuse to allow to happen. And that's not really normal. Normally on cybersecurity, you're all generally pulling in the same direction. It was tough enough to make progress even when everyone was pulling in the same direction. Do you, um, so your book, A Fierce Domain, Conflict in Cyberspace, 1986 to, to 2012, uh, was really the first effort, I think, to write a history of cyber conflict. Uh, why did you write it and what were the principal takeaways? 
Well, you know, it's getting to the stories in the public square, right? We were having these, we were trying to have this debate about what's cyber conflict like? What is it not like? What is it, how has it been, how have nations actually fought it yeah. over the last couple of decades? Is it new, is it, or is it, is it brand new, or is it actually similar to other kinds of conflicts that we've had? Uh, is it more like espionage? Is it more like warfare? Is it more like crime? And I found going into this that there just wasn't, there weren't any sources for me to go. So I, I love military history, right? Yeah. And, and if you like military history, you can go back and say, well, what happened? Uh, well, we've got uh, Naval War College here in, in Newport, Rhode Island. They will go back and study old naval battles so that those officers can say, when I'm captaining that ship, when I'm the admiral of that fleet, what would I do differently versus what Halsey did right. um, back in World War II? And yet in my field, we don't do that. We don't say, hey, here was this important event that happened in cybersecurity. What lessons should we take from it? So I'm curious about your own background um, on all levels, really. But you served time in the Air Force. Tell us about that, and how does that now inform? You didn't serve time. You <laughs> served <laughs> in. There was no incarceration. <laughs> my bad. I'm thinking of incarceration. Don't even ask me why. You served in the US Air Force. Yes. And thank you for your service. What prompted you to go there? And what, mm -hmm. how has that informed what you do now? Uh, well, I, I went to high school in Rhode Island, at Cranston East, 1987, and uh, Top Gun had just come out, and I said, boy, wouldn't that be a, <laughs> wouldn't that There's be always a, a Hollywood connection. Wouldn't that be a fabulous thing to be a fighter pilot? And, the, and so I went there, and, and I decided, man, I would be a terrible fighter pilot. <laughs> <laughs> just, and so I said, and it was automatic, right? I would not to be a fighter pilot, but I turned down a pilot training slot so that I could compete for an intelligence slot. Because I said, boy, I bet I could be a good, um, I bet I could be a good thinker. I bet I could be Why pretty good Why did you think you'd be a bad pilot? Uh, yeah, it's just. Um, just wasn't you. Uh, yeah, it just wasn't, it just wasn't gonna be in the cards, right? I mean, you need a lot of skills for that. And, and um, I got to see a lot of my classmates who were really dedicated to it. And I, and I knew that I was gonna be that, dedica that dedicated to it. So you went into intelligence. Yeah, so I, and I had to compete for that slot. And it turns out, especially in the 90s when I was doing this, that a lot of people uh, from the field I was in, from intelligence, were getting into computer security. We understood computers, we understood digital communications. Um, I was working at the time uh, 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 with NSA and later for NSA, uh, the, the U.S. National Security Agency, so the mm -hmm. intelligence agency that was getting into people's communications. And so there was already that part of computer security in that. How do you keep such things from happening to you? And so that led me to, to, um, getting, to creating the first Joint Cyber Command in the United States back in 1998. So there's a, there's a running debate in D.C. about, you know, which part of the federal government uh, should have primary lead for responsibility for a cyber attack on government networks, mm -hmm. on private sector networks. Uh, where does that debate stand now, and is it sufficiently resolved in your opinion? They've resolved it as far as, how the, uh, as, far as the bureaucracy. And frankly, the, the, the answer as far as the bureaucracy hasn't really changed. Uh, so I was in the White House about 15 years ago, and the, and the answer hasn't changed in the last 15 years. It's pretty much going to be the Department of Homeland Security that handles all sorts of um, uh, disasters befalling the United States, from earthquakes or hurricanes to, uh, to cyber attacks. So uh, the issue has been, well, so the first issue was, well, then how does FBI and Department of Defense fit into that? And we've largely fit that. If it's, if it's really kind of warfare, then DOD will start to make more, more of a role. If it's fighting crime and trying to put people in jail, then FBI handles that part. And that's been about the same for 15 years. The issue has been it's been difficult for D the Department of Homeland Security to live up to those responsibilities. Mm -hmm. DOD is really well funded. It has a lot of really focused and intense people. It's got great relations with Congress. It only has a few congressional committees it has to report to, and DHS has been challenged around all of those areas. It's new, and, it's, and it really hasn't come together yet in the way that I think its creators had hoped it would. Is there, is there though, a risk or an added vulnerability for American society, for American institutions, because DHS is maybe not sufficiently resourced or organized or supported on Capitol Hill to be as effective as it should be? Well, I think so, and I think, uh, the Obama administration been looking at this quite seriously and trying to figure out the ways. I know um, the, uh, the Trump administration, their folks are, are inheriting that. Um, Tom Bossert, the President's Homeland Security Advisor, 
had been worrying about these issues when um, in the last Bush administration. So it's the same problem 10 years on. And, um, and so I know they're inheriting a lot of that frustration, and we'll see what happens. There, there are some practical things that can get done, and I know that they're, they're looking to roll up their sleeves and get those done. So in the context of this conversation, what keeps you up at night? Sure. Uh, I am, uh, especially when we're talking about cyber conflict, uh, I'm especially worried that nations will start to miscalculate. That either that we start using cyber things because we've been using cyber capabilities against each other to spy, to get weapons in place so that if we ever need them, like if if Russia is ever going to fight U.S., they're putting capabilities into our power grid, for example, so that in case they ever need it, they can they'll be able to shut off the power. And assumedly, we're doing the same to them with China, with India and, pa and Pakistan, um, and so there, this is a lot of chance for miscalculation in this, where nations say, well, we're doing this all the time, and something doesn't go quite right, or the leader of the other nation decides that uh, this is intolerable and cannot stand. So that worries me that some of these attacks that like we talked about, the Internet of Things, um, several hospitals have been taken down by, by cyber attacks. They've had to reschedule surgeries. People are going to start dying soon if we start if, if we're not starting what we're doing. So we only have literally a minute, fifteen seconds left. But and this might be too big a question, but I'm going to ask it. The uh, laws of war apply mm -hmm. to uh, armed combat, yep. right? It's against the laws of war to bomb a hospital. Yeah. Uh, is it against the laws of war? Is it a war crime to shut down a network that operates a hospital that then leads to human the loss of human life? If you are talking about it during wartime then yes, and the U.S. and the United, uh, United Kingdom and other nations have agreed to that. Russia and China push back on that, surprisingly. Interesting. Uh, Jason Healy, this is a fascinating conversation, and we appreciate you being with us today. Uh, the book is a fierce domain, uh, and we want to thank you, whether you're at home, in your car, or listening to us on your phone. Thank you for being part of Storing the Public Square. If you want to know more about the show and the work we do, you can visit us at PellCenter.org, or you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. He's G. Wayne Miller. I'm Jim Lutis, and we hope you'll join us again next week for more Storing the Public Square. <laughs>